Hello, good evening and welcome to tonight's 5 by 15. It's great to see so many of you with us. And we've got a really great list of speakers lined up for you tonight. Sadly, Suzanne Brack is unable to be with us, but she will be joining a 5 by 15 later on next year, probably. So this evening, we're going to be, as ever, traveling around the place. We're going to Britain's Atlantic rainforest. We're going to the Arctic. We're going to Thomas Mann's life in Los Angeles, as well as looking at the extraordinary power of walking, and not just any walk, but a particular walk that was very, very long. As ever, our speakers are going to be talking for about 12, 13, 14 minutes, something like that. I'll pop back up on the screen if they overrun the time. And all their books are available from Newham Books and any other good bookstore, and the details will be in the chat. So without further ado, let me introduce our first speaker tonight, who is Guy Shrubsole, and he's the author of an incredible book called The Lost Rainforests of Britain. It's been a real game changer as it's made people look at the forests and the woods around us, especially ancient woodland, where the, the, wild, the wildlife and the fauna and the flora are so rich and complicated. And Atlantic rainforests are a lot in the West Country, but not just there, as you will find out from Guy. Guy's had himself a rich and very varied career. He has been in DEFRA, our Department of Agriculture, as well as working for the New Zealand government. And prior to writing this book, he also wrote a book called Who Owns England, which I can absolutely assure you was a real eye opener and a brilliant idea for a book. So with no further ado, over to Guy, who's joining us tonight from Dartington, just outside Totnes. Guy. Thank you very much, Rosie. And I'm just going to share my screen to share some slides. So hopefully you can all see my first slide here, which is the front cover of my new book, The Lost Rainforest of Britain. It may at first glance look like a photo, but actually it's a beautiful watercolour by the fantasy artist Alan Lee, who's better known uh, for illustrating um, the works of Tolkien. And I first met Alan uh, about a year ago or slightly, slightly more. Uh, as he lives on the edges of Dartmoor and has always been inspired by Dartmoor's amazing wet woodlands. And um, when I realised that he'd been essentially inspired by some of Britain's rainforests to depict creatures like the Ents in Lord of the Rings, I, I knew I had to not only speak to him and interview him for the book, but also um, ask him cheekily if he would uh, illustrate the front cover to my book. So as they say, don't judge a book on its cover. Well, please do judge my book on this cover because it's probably the best thing about it. <laughs> but um, I wanted to start by talking really about um, how I got interested in, in rainforests. And it started a long time ago um, when I was growing up in the 1980s and 1990s, um, the big cause celebre of the Western environmental movement was the Save the Rainforests campaign. And this was of course a big international effort movement to save the Amazon rainforest in Brazil and other tropical rainforests. Uh, and I remember when I was about five years old, um, my mum organised uh, a Save the Rainforest fundraiser party for Friends of the Earth. And we painted a big poster um, with colourful toucans and parrots on it um, to try and, you know, highlight the, pl the plight of the rainforests. And um, it's, it's a moment that stayed with me. I later went on to work for Friends of the Earth as a campaigner later in life. And obviously the battle to save the world's tropical rainforests remains incredibly urgent and uh, has obviously been uh, on our minds, I think, recently with the defeat, thankfully, of President Bolsonaro in Brazil and the re-election of uh, Lula da Silva, who I think whose victory is a real ray of hope for tropical rainforests because he has pledged to end deforestation in the Amazon. But I guess what I didn't realize when I was um, growing up and when I began uh, campaigning for Friends of the Earth was actually how Britain has rainforests too. Uh, it might feel and sound like a slightly outlandish claim, um, but it, ecologists agree that we have rainforests here too, right under our noses. And let me just show you a picture of one of them. This is Black Tor Copse on Dartmoor. You can see here, this wonderful ancient gnarled woodland teeming with epithetic plants, which are really the, one of the defining characteristics of our rainforests, those tent tentacular octopoid, octopoid limbs reaching out from the ancient gnarled trunks of these oak trees. 
And when we talk about, when we think about tropical rainforests, very clearly they're rainy and they're hot. And what we have in Britain are temperate rainforests, which are rainy but cool. And they're actually even rarer than tropical rainforests. They only cover about 1% of the world's surface. Um, and whilst I was sort of, you know, had to take some persuading that we did have rainforests in Britain, once I started exploring them and thinking about it, I actually, uh, you know, Britain is obviously such a rainy little country. We're stereotypically obsessed by how rainy our weather is. And after a while, it started to seem to me that actually it's not at all surprising that we have rainforests at all. They've evolved to take advantage of this very rainy weather and climate that we have. And I live in Devon and in Dartmoor, where conditions are, are pretty perfect for rainforests, temperate rainforests to evolve and to thrive. Um, by one definition, uh, the threshold for temperate rainforest is starts where you get to about 1400 millimetres of rainfall in a year on average, which is, you know, when you think about it, nearly one and a half metres is quite a lot of rainfall. Um, but that's what we get on Dartmoor and, and indeed on, along um, large stretches of the west of Britain. And I think my next slide shows you a bit more of a sense of where we get temperate rainforests occurring um, in a big swathe uh, from Cornwall through Devon, up through Wales, up to the Lake District, uh, up through Galloway, Dumfries and to Argyll and the Western Highlands. And um, as you can see, from this map here, um, the one here on the left, that actually um, our rainforest zone uh, in Britain covers quite a large area, around 20% of the country. But in fact, what is left is, is much, much less, unfortunately. And I'll talk a little bit more about that in a second. But first, I just wanted to give you a bit more of a flavor of, of what we find in our temperate rainforest, what really defines them. Uh, these epiphytes. They are plants that grow on other plants. They survive and thrive on the fact that um, there's enough rainfall, enough moisture, enough nutrients coming from the rainfall that means that these plants can grow on the trunks and branches of the trees in our temperate rainforest. They don't have to be anchored in the ground in order to get enough moisture and enough nutrients. And so these are a couple of examples uh, of the sorts of species we get in our temperate rainforest, some of the more rare and more exotic and interesting and char charismatic microflora, as I like to call them. We hear a lot in conservation about charismatic megafauna, people talking about pandas and lions and tigers. Um, these are all very important uh, parts of ecosystems as well, but I th also think that we really need to remember the plants, the fungi, the, the ultimately the, the um, organisms that allow all the other uh, creatures that we so love and, and cherish to survive. And I think one of my first abiding memories of going into one of Britain's temperate rainforests was really how green it all was. And obviously all woods in Britain are green in summer, uh, but temperate rainforests are green all year round because of this absolute you know, abundance of epiphytes of mosses, lichens, ferns, all clinging and festooning trees and giving them this sort of green aura. You get polypody ferns, which kind of give this sort of halo to the branches of temperate rainforest trees. You get lichens like tree lungwort pictured here, Labaria pulmonaria, which um, is so named uh, because of um, its, its reputed uh, herbal medicinal properties or thought that that was what was thought by medieval herbalists. I'm not sure there's actually any evidence that it was a cure for lung disease, but that's how it's got its name. Uh, to very weird denizens of our temperate rainforest, like hazel gloves fungus, pictured here in orange, this very orange uh, glove-like, mitten-like um, fungus that grabs hold of branches, and I think is an absolutely amazing, uh, amazing organism to find. And, um, you know, Britain's temperate rainforests are ecologically world-beating. They really support over 500 species of of lichens, 160 species of mosses and liverworts. They're kind of arguably the pinnacle of Britain's woodlands and a vital part of the biodiversity of these islands since, um, since the last ice age. And it's also, it, it, they're also incredibly important because of the amount of carbon they soak up. Obviously woodlands, all woodlands are locking up carbon in their trunks in the woody matter that makes up their branches and in forest floors, but our temperate rainforests are arguably um, also adding to the carbon stock in our woods through the soil that's forming in the canopy 
of these forests because so many generations of bryophytes, mosses, liverworts live and die on, the, on, these, on these branches that they form this soil-like crust in the, in the upper canopy of the trees, which adds to the carbon that uh, they're locking up in the air. So they really are vi really vital allies in the fight against the climate crisis. But tragically, Britain is a rainforest nation that cut down most of its rainforests. And whilst much of this took place a long time ago, back as long ago as the Bronze Age, when settlers started to fell the ancient wildwood to clear land for farming, unforgivably, I think some of our rainforests were cut down as recently as the 20th century. And that was as a result of misguided forestry practices that saw them as economically useless, as mere scrub um, that needed to be felled to make way for productive uh, timber, basically pine monocultures that um, contributed to, to many, many of our ancient woodlands being felled between the 1950s and the 1980s. What actually stops our temperate rainforests from returning, however, is something else. And it's pictured in this slide here. It is the sheep. And uh, we have large, large numbers of sheep in, in Britain these days, uh, have done since the 20th century, particularly since farm subsidies started to incentivize um, increased herd density, increased herd numbers, something called headage payments, which we used to have under the common agricultural policy. And sheep, as a non-native species to Britain, don't just nibble the grass, they also love nibbling young saplings as well. And that means that they uh, really affect the natural regeneration of woodlands and uh, particularly of temperate rainforests. And if you ever thought that the number of sheep in our countryside is normal and natural, I, I have to disabuse you of that notion. Unfortunately, we are, um, you know, Britain has some of the highest stocking densities of sheep in Europe, if not in the world. In uh, Wales, there are three times as many sheep as people. Um, and it's particularly a high stocking density in our western upland areas, which is uh, the areas that have the right climate for temperate rainforest. And that's actually no coincidence, because if you talk to any farmer, they'll quite rightly say that the west of Britain is good for growing grass. But the problem is, and the thing is, is that the west of Britain is even better for growing rainforest. So axes, chainsaws, sheep and deer have reduced Britain's rainforest from an ecosystem that covered maybe a fifth of Britain's landmass uh, once upon a time to something considerably less than 1% of the country today. And that's a tragedy, but I think even, even worse is the fact that few people nowadays are even aware of the existence of Britain's rainforests. There's an ecologist called Dominic Sala, De La Sala who has written that, and I quote, because very few rainforests remain throughout Europe, those undertaking rescue efforts today operate much like detectives in search of clues. And more broadly, we suffer in modern society from something that's been termed plant blindness, which is you know, a, a kind of a, a malady in which uh, one, something that I suffered from certainly until a few years back when I started trying to learn the names of wildflowers and talking to more botanists and, and, and naturalists, just to kind of understand better this, what I was seeing, which was a blur of green um, and not really dis dis distinguishing between the, the sheer myriad variety of plants that we have in Britain. I just wanted to say a little bit more, though, not just about the ecological importance of our temperate rainforests, but also about their cultural importance. And I think that's something else that makes them incredibly valuable and something that's really worth preserving and restoring. When I started researching our temperate rainforests, I really realized that actually they've been woven into some of our oldest myths and legends. Um, and have inspired some of our greatest writers and poets. So I looked at, for example, the Mabinogion, the ancient Welsh myths, or collection of myths. And the first four books of the Mabinogion are known as the four branches of the Mabinogi, which is the structure itself suggesting a tree. And they recount, amongst other tales, the story of the Welsh wizard Gwydion, whose name means woodwise or possibly born of trees, and whose character seems to contain an echo of the Celtic Druids, whose Name is also derived from the Atlantic oak woods, the Celtic deru, which means oak, and id, meaning knowledge, so druid or deruid translates as oak seer. And Gwydion, the shape-shifting magician of the Mabinogion, features in many stories that demonstrate the power and importance of the Atlantic rainforests to the people who sang and later wrote down these stories. In one, Gwydion takes the flowers of the oak 
and the flowers of the broom and the flowers of the meadow sweet and conjures a woman out of flowers, uh, out of these flowers called Bladuith, who becomes of another central character in the stories. And another Welsh poem in which Gwydion features is called The Battle of the Trees. And if you've ever seen the Lord of the Rings movies, you'll um, know the uh, last march of the Ents, in which Treebeard le leads the Ents to defend uh, defend uh, Fangorn Forest. And in The Battle of the Trees, this is a kind of a telling of this story 2000 years, more or less, perhaps before Tolkien uh, wrote it down, which is around how, how Gwydion, um, the wizard, animated an entire forest to rise up against the forces of the Celtic other world who were invading the, our world. Um, and, um, you know, I, I think I think it's stories like these that um, adds to this sense of how enchanting these places are and have been for many generations of people. And I really want to, um, in writing this book, I really wanted to help re-enchant people with the magic of our rainforests. I think they're hugely important, both ecologically and culturally. And I hope that I, by collectively remembering them, by seeing them again, seeing them afresh, we can not only appreciate them for what they are, but also start that process of restoring them. So I hope you've been inspired by this little taster of, of our, our temperate rainforests. I speak a lot more about them, obviously, in my book. Um, and I hope you'll join me in helping to restore and bring back Britain's lost rainforests. Hi, Jack, a question for you. Um, I know Rosie had some problems with her video earlier. Do you want me just to kick off? I can introduce myself. If that's okay, Gail, if you could that's, kick off. That, that, that's not a problem at all. After two years with the pandemic, I think we're all used to um, having, having um, uh, to dance on our feet, so to speak. Hello, everybody. My name is Gail Whiteman. I'm a professor of sustainability at the University of Exeter, and I'm also the founder of a science communication not-for-profit called Arctic Base Camp. What I want to talk about today is um, uh, not the rainforest, but the Arctic and the subarctic, and really about how do we make sense of environmental risk coming from these regions. And I'm going to do that by by telling um, uh, three stories. The first story is is uh, starts a long time ago, nearly 26 years ago, almost exactly. Um, I moved to the subarctic to start my PhD in the most northern part of Canada. Uh, with the James Bay Cree. Uh, the Cree have lived there for thousands of years successfully, and I wanted to figure out what they were doing. Originally, I, I went to try to uh, take a look at the impact of development on this pristine area. And quickly what I learned was that the hunters and the trappers that lived there said that I had to move into the bush to actually really understand uh, the area. And so I did. So on November 11th, 1996, I actually moved into a bush camp which was about 600 square kilometers of wilderness. I was with a hunting family uh, one winter, temperatures uh, at night were minus 50 degrees Celsius. During the day, they were minus 30. And on that very first day, I started on my first trip with a hunter and we went out in the ca canoe uh, uh, and we were going to get some gas. And on that day, I actually nearly died. Um, when we got to the top of a very large rapid, um, we started to walk and we started to do some of his basic tasks. And I was so inexperienced in this kind of ecosystem that I slipped and I fell down uh, some black ice on a rock face and into the very top of a rapids hanging on to uh, um, rocks for my dear life. Um, I, of course, screamed. I don't remember that. Um, I don't remember making much sound, but luckily the hunter found me, ran, and eventually got me out of the water. At that point, I thought that we would go home. Um, I was cold. It was near freeze up, so I was going hypothermic. Uh, and actually what he did was he made me change, uh, and then he made me continue to do the tasks that we had set out to do that day. So we did a full day's work after that. And I couldn't believe it at the time. For me, we'd been in a highly dangerous, risky situation. And I just wanted to go back to the bush camp. I wanted to have a hot, hot cup of tea. And I wanted really to go home. And eventually we did get back in the boat and on we went and we did go home and we did have a hot cup of tea. And I realized that that would have been my second mistake to want to actually go home immediately because what he had known and I had not 
was not just that this landscape, which was beautiful, it was pristine in my mind, could be dangerous in a slip of a boot, but also it could be dangerous if you didn't understand what did hypothermia mean, and that the last thing you wanted to do was to get back into a boat, you actually needed to warm up and get your body temperature, your core temper up before you go actually into, into uh, onto the, the water again. Now, I spent two years living with the Cree, and they taught me many things. And in the 10 weeks I spent on that winter in a bush camp, it was clear that even in 1996, that there were things that were happening with the ice that were like nothing they had seen before. Now, the Cree had lived there for thousands of years. Uh, certainly, the hunters and the families that I lived with spent all of their time outside, uh, particularly during the winter. So they had minute and detailed understanding of that landscape but also they had historic understanding of the landscape and the fact that the ice was changing. And indeed, unfortunately, uh, while I was there, a hunter went through the ice in a place that was supposed to uh, be safe. It had historically always been safe at that part of the year uh, and it had gone through and was uh, found only at uh, the next spring when the ice thawed. That was my first experience with climate impacts. Uh, what they were seeing in EU Ashti, which is what the Cree called uh, uh, the land, was one of the early uh, manifestations of a changing climate. And they noticed it much faster than I would have done as a grad student because they understood how important it was. Now, the interesting thing to me about this story is not only was it a breathtaking experience and the Arctic is a, a compelling place, but it was that the local people understood the importance of their landscape and also understood that it was changing. They didn't necessarily know why, but they understood much faster than many of us at the time, 1996, understood it was. Now, fast forward 26 years, uh, current day. Well, the, the Cree are in the press again. The area that I did my PhD, although it's, it's had hydroelectric development, it's had forestry, it's had mining, is actually now under a, a, a campaign to defend it again. It is one of the most carbon dense areas in the world, and it holds twice as much carbon per hectare as the Amazon. And when the Cree start to use the language that of that uh, carbon uh, dense, uh, much more carbon than the Amazon, the rest of the world starts to listen a lot more than when they simply say it's important for our culture. So when we talk about risk coming from the Arctic and the subarctic, risk depends on where you are, depends on who you are, and depends on how you make sense of minute changes. I've spent my entire career since that time actually trying to identify and communicate these sorts of global risks uh, in these kinds of places. With the work that I do with Arctic Base Camp, we're a science communication um, organization. Uh, uh, what we try to do is we try to speak science to power, and we focus on the Arctic because the Arctic is rapidly changing. Now, of course, it's important to the people of the Arctic, but it also opens up shipping, so it's important to all kinds of people around the world. But the research and the data that, that I know that my science team knows is that what happens in the Arctic doesn't stay there but it's really hard to make sense of that when we're so far away. So take Greenland, for example. Put a, a picture of Greenland in your mind. It, uh, we just saw Frozen Planet 2, so we've got, got it well, well placed. It has to be one of the, if not the most beautiful places in the world. And even when you see it melting, it is still one of the most beautiful places in the world. And that's quite different than a forest that has been clear cut or wildfires that have ravaged an area or drought or flooding. When the Arctic is in crisis, it still looks beautiful and it still is very far away. And we're not really sure how it touches our lives uh, today as, as we know it. So we do know Greenland is melting. Uh, who doesn't? Uh, we've heard it's bad news for the polar bear. Is it bad news for us? Well, part of our science team at Arctic Base Camp has published research that shows that right now, even if we stop all emissions, all greenhouse ga gas emissions today, Greenland, the ice sheet, will still melt up to 3% of its volume. Now, again, the number three, if I say it, sounds kind of small. We know Greenland is kind of big. So where does that net out? Well, it's hard when we start to say it will be centimeters, 18 centimeters of sea level rise in the next 60, 70, 80 years. Again, those numbers could be big if it was immediate, but if over such a long period of time seems small. 
But what if I showed you a bottle of water from Greenland, from the ice sheet? And here, actually, I've got one because we did this. We, we went to Greenland and we bottled water from one of the melting uh, glaciers. So here it is. It's about the size of a wine bottle. And if I said to you how many of these bottles, so these ones right here, imagine a wine bottle, are melting a second, what would you say? So just in your mind as your audience here, how many bottles a second are you melting? I've asked CEOs this, I've asked uh, um, uh, politicians this, I've asked the general public. Very rarely do they get the number I'm about to tell you. Well, these aren't wine bottles, these are glacier melt bottles, but based on a decade average of data, 17 million of these bottles are melting a second. 17 million every second based on a decade average. So that's a ton of water. And where's it going? Well, it's going into sea level rise, of course. That's where it's going. But it's not just Greenland. If we know the Arctic in general, it's warming four times faster than the rest of the planet. If we look at the ice, that's the, the, the sea ice, the summer sea ice, sure, it melts every year. And then it freezes again in the winter. But 75% of the volume of that ice, that sea ice, has disappeared, has melted, is not coming back in the winter. And if we look at the sea ice as our sort of insurance policy against runaway climate change, we've lost 75% of that. On top of that, we know that the Greenland, uh, uh, sorry, not Greenland, but the Arctic uh, land itself is thawing, permafrost is releasing, and the Arctic itself is getting greener. So there's less white, there's more green, there's more heat going in. So we can say that we know that the Arctic is in crisis. At the same time, when I'm talking to world leaders or I'm talking to politicians or I'm talking to business executives, unless I bring it home to them, those Arctic risks don't really mean very much. So my final story here is one I want to show you, uh, tell you about uh, um, the UN meetings, both in Glasgow uh, last year and in Sharm el Sheikh in Egypt this year. What we try to do with Arctic Base Camp is try to bring the Arctic into those meetings. In Glasgow, we actually brought a Greenland iceberg to Glasgow. We let it melt during the COP. Um, uh, we shipped it in. We carbon offset uh, its emissions. That's a problem. It's not really perfect, but it was something that we did that we felt we had to bring some of the Arctic right there. The interesting thing is that as delegates and as people attending the conference walked past it day on day out, they kept saying to us, hey, couldn't you put a tarp on it? Couldn't you somehow protect it from that Glaswegian rain? And we said, no, this iceberg is melting here and a lot more bergs are melting up in the actual Arctic. So the point is, is that it seems far away, but when we bring things prox into proximity, people start to understand them in a way that they didn't before. Now, the Arctic doesn't stay in the Arctic. It affects everything that we do. It affects extreme weather, um, threats to food and water security, uh, sea level rise, supply chain disruption, you name it, the Arctic has its hand in it. If we lose the snow and ice, all that white, we will amplify climate change by 25 to 40 percent globally. So it's not uh, just something that happens far away and it's bad news for the polar bear. So my final story here is something that we are doing for Sharm el Sheikh, because I could stay as just Professor Doom and Gloom, and some days I am like that. But what we wanted to do this time was just do um, some way that we could talk about the global risks of Arctic change in a way that could reach new audiences, those that were not necessarily paying attention to climate change, not necessarily paying attention to what was happening in Sharm el Sheikh. So we worked with one of our board members, uh, the U.S. actor Rain Wilson, on this call. Some of you may know him as uh, a Dwight Shute from the American version of The Office. It's a U.K. audience, so you're probably more familiar with the Ricky Gervais version. But Rain is on our board, and he has been um, a tireless supporter of trying to help us figure out how to communicate Arctic risk um, in ways that actual normal people that are not interested in climate change can do so. So what we did uh, uh, this time is we convinced uh, Rain, so Rain Wilson is his name, to change his name last Thursday. I don't know if you saw it on Sky or The Guardian, but certainly throughout the US, it completely went viral. Rain Wilson changed his name to Rainfall um, uh, Heat Wave Extreme Winter Wilson and explained to people that they too could change their name 
to an Arctic risk name. We set up an online tool on one of our, our things, and indeed I am Gail Uncontrollable Wildfire Whiteman, as opposed to my normal name of just Gail Whiteman. Now, is that too trite? Is that too um, simplistic? I don't know. The jury is out. What I have seen, though, is that so many more people have engaged with this issue, are aware of the Arctic and global risk in, in, than they were in the past. We've had 100,000 names generated on our online tool, and we've had 500 media stories with a reach of, I don't know, a potential reach of, of millions and millions and millions. And my question, I suppose, that I ask myself and my team is that if we're going to talk about Arctic risk and communicate that, we have to also think about the opportunities to talk in a way that scientists don't normally talk to. Thank you. Gail, thank you so much. That was really fantastic. And I'm incredibly sorry that um, things got a bit scrambled on air and I didn't manage to introduce uh, you but and, and tell people how amazing you were and how amazing <laughs> Arctic Space Camp was. I saw your eyes. Yeah, it was just great. Our next speaker tonight is uh, an old friend, Colin Boybean, who I'm so thrilled is going to be here with us tonight on Five by Feen. Colin has written many, many wonderful books, written many awards. He's the uh, author of Brooklyn, which was turned into an extraordinary film, as well as The Testament of Mary, which became a box office seller book of essays is called I guess, Feast, and it gathers together many of Colin's recent uh, life experiences, whether it's his cancer diagnosis or finding himself alone in Venice, written as always with his trademark humour, wit, gentleness, and just incisive understanding. But his most recent novel has been The Magician, which is a fictional retelling of the life of Thomas Mann. Adam is joining us tonight from LA. He's going to be telling us the story of Thomas Mann's life in Los Angeles in the 1940s. Colin, a big welcome. Thank you so much for joining us and um, I know it's morning your time it certainly looks a lot sunnier outside the window than it does here so over to you and thank you so much for being thank you very much Rosie yeah it's a beautiful morning in LA uh, as if things weren't bad enough in 1940 Alma Mahler decided it was time for her to cross the Pyrenees she had been married to Gustav Mahler the composer and Walter Gropius the architect she was now married to the writer Franz Werfel the fact that two of her husbands were Jewish seemed to puzzle her because she was suffering from an anti-Semitism that moved from being mild to being shrill. She had 23 suitcases. They arrived in Lourdes, I mean, yeah, the place of St. Bernadette, and they waited there wondering what they should do. Um, Franz Berkel decided he went down to the grotto and um, saw the all the St. Bernadette, all the processions, and he said, if we get out of here alive, if we get out of this Lourdes place alive, I will write a book and I will make this place much more famous than it already, than it already is. The, there was, there, they were very lucky that there was a man in the south of France called Varian Fry, who was working at one remove for the American government. His, and his job was to get famous people to come to America as refugees. He wanted to get Picasso, he wanted to get Braque, he wanted to get people of that ilk to come. Instead, of course, secretly, he was working at getting left-wing people out getting anyone really in danger um, out of the south of France, away from the Nazis, into Spain and from Spain to America. And so he helped. He got the, three, he got the 23 suitcases and uh, he, he, he got them to go by train, but he needed the people to walk over the Pyrenees. Golo Mann, Thomas Mann's um, son, had been in, held in a concentration camp very briefly, had escaped, was now with his uncle Heinrich, Heinrich Mann, the writer, and Heinrich's second wife. Um, and their job was to get them over the Pyrenees. Heinrich was almost 70 at this point, suffering from a bad heart. Goloman describes um, Alma Mahler as she was wearing a white dress to walk over the Pyrenees and her dress billowed in the wind as they, as they climbed like a flag of surrender. Um, and, um, and so um, they set out um, to, make the way, um, to make the way across the Atlantic. Um, Alma Mahler strangely had with her in a briefcase, which she held close to her all the time, the actual fourth symphony of Bruckner in his own hand, which she had attempted, and I do not make this up, to sell to Hitler personally, Hitler personally being involved as a collector in collecting 
manuscripts and scores of music, especially the music of Bruckner, which was notorious because he had written so many versions, so many versions have been made. Hitler, Hitler, I mean, Adolf Hitler wanted the original and he was prepared to buy it from Alma Mahler, who was ready to sell it to him. She went to the German embassy in Paris, but the problem was she wanted cash and they didn't have enough cash. And so she ended up carrying this, plus a lock of Beethoven's hair, which had been given to her husband. She carried these two over the Pyrenees and they made their way to America. In America, when the boat landed, they were met by Thomas Mann and his wife. Thomas Mann was the most famous among the German exiles um, at that time um, in America. He had befriended or he had bonded with Roosevelt, who trusted him and saw him as a figure of the center. When so many who had come were figures of the left and so many who had come were also suspect in various ways, Mann seemed to have risen above this. Um, this, he was born in 1875, which means by this time he's 65, 66. He, had, he won the Nobel Prize in 1929 and he's living in Princeton. And so his son, he, he now has rescued all of his family from Europe. His six children are now in America. His daughter, Monica, she, she managed to cross on a boat called the Isle of Benares, which was torpedoed on its way to Canada. Her husband was drowned, but she survived. So Thomas Mann has now got his visas for his six children, for, for, for his brother and for his sister-in-law, and he's in Princeton. The question is, and the strange question, why did most of these people move to Los Angeles? What did Los Angeles have that, for example, New York, Washington or Boston didn't have? Um, at first, of course, it's easy to say that some of them went because of Hollywood but actually very few ended up working with Hollywood. Hollywood didn't, didn't want German writers to write screenplays in general, and people who, who were involved in music, again, very, very scarcely used. Perhaps it's, it can be explained by looking at how Irish people, who came generally from very remote places in the west of Ireland, from the islands or from Connemara, small farms, um, why did they not want to go to farms in America? Why did they go to Boston, New York? Why did they become cops and firemen, the men and the women work, for example, as maids in houses in the cities? Because they wanted to, America wanted to offer them some sort of change. The last thing they wanted was to return to the very site of their own poverty, which was fields, land, farming. They wanted to become urban. They became urban some within a week. They, they, they sort of follow their brothers, their cousins into various jobs in construction or into being firemen. So too, the German exiles, the last thing they wanted was a reproduction of Munich or Berlin in the new country. They wanted things that Germany didn't have. They wanted sunshine and they wanted um, being close to the big ocean. And of course it was cheap. And also what was more important was that Los Angeles is to, even to this day, a really good place for outsiders. It's built by outsiders. It's made up of outsiders. And so they didn't stand out as much as Germans as they would have in Philadelphia or in New York or indeed in Princeton. And so um, they arrived, the German intellectuals, um, fi figures like um, Arnold Schoenberg, the composer, Horkheimer, the sociologist, Adorno, the musicologist and philosopher, Thomas Mann, the writer, his brother Heinrich, the writer, and many, many more arrived in Los Angeles. And of, and of course included Bertolt Brecht, uh, the playwright who disliked Thomas Mann intensely, Thomas Mann did not like him either. So the feuds in a way that had been going on anyway in Germany were now exacerbated by the fact that these, these, were in a, these Germans were now in a bubble in Los Angeles. They saw one another reg regularly. There was a great deal of backbiting and, and faction fighting. I should say that once Alma Mahler arrived on the scene, this backbiting, backbiting and feuding intensified because she, she could move among all of them fomenting this and seeing whatever trouble she, she could cause. Um, I mean, Berthold wrote his book called Song of Bernadette. He wrote it genuinely as an act of homage to the place he, ha he had been, the promise he had made that he would write a book about St. Bernadette. Little did he know as he was writing the book that this, of all the books written by the German exiles in these war years in America, this was the book that would hit the spot, written by a Jewish writer about a saint and um, written in a sort of, I suppose we might call it a sugary style or a style that at least accepted the possibility of the miraculous. And it was made into a film and it made um, Alma Mahler even richer than she was. She had obviously all the income from the, the, from the music of Gustav Mahler and now she had uh, this, this money as well. Thomas Mann's book sold incredibly well in America. 
among the exiles, he was the one who, who's, any household above a certain level of culture in America had the hardbacks of Thomas Mann, Budden Brooks, The Magic Mountain, those books. And so that he could live extremely well in America. He built a beautiful house recently, which has been um, remade by the, uh, redone by the German government on Pacific Palisades near Santa Monica. He built this beautiful mid-century California house, um, all white outside, all the, the, the glass, um, uh, the mixture of glass and shade and um, a lot of open plan. Plus, of course, what he wanted was a study for himself away from open plan uh, in the shade with, with, less, um, with less window space great number of bookshelves as though he was creating the old Germany he actually managed to get his desk out of Munich and it traveled with him in, including some paintings so he remade his old study from Munich in this house in Pacific Palisades away from the rest of the house which was a much more Californian house and he did two things in this period when he was living in Los Angeles and um, the house he built was ready by 1942. We, we noticed the house, even though it's for a, it's for a man in his, um, who's now 67 years old and his wife, who's, that, that, that there are rooms for each of their children because of their six children, four still have not settled, even though they're moving into their forties. They still are, are single, that the, that the rise of Hitler and the arrival of the war has completely disrupted any possibility they have of putting down roots yeah. of their own. They're, this is still, the family house is still their house. So it looks like a house built by a young couple for a growing family. It's by an elderly couple for a family that in, in certain ways and very interesting ones ha has not fully grown. Thomas Mann, as I said, did two things now in that house. But first he became a great public figure in America during the war years with the assistance and support of the president. He began to move around the country and in his faltering English, he began to make public speeches in places like Oklahoma or Ohio or Chicago and his speech was about the coming victory of democracy. It was not about the need to defeat Hitler. He was taking that for granted. It, 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 it was not about the war engine, which he fully supported. Instead, it was an, an attempt to see the future in the light of the past, to say that there, there is an old German culture which, was, which would lead you towards democracy, an old German culture which was filled with light and possibility, and, 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 an, and an idea of culture which was inclusive rather than destructive. He understood that that culture too had its poisonous elements. He took that in, in a way for granted too, but he was saying, I speak as a German, I speak in a way as a good German, I speak as a German filled with hope for democracy in the future. We're fighting for not to defeat our enemies, but to win democracy. And that where he said at one point, wherever I am, Germany is, meaning that his reading, his writing, his entire cultural background represented something that in itself could offer a future to Germany. In the meantime, he was planning a book called Dr. Faustus. And in, and in that book, he would look at the life of a German composer called Adrian Leverkusen, a fictional composer in the early years of the 20th century. And of course, for that, he needed a composer. And in the, at those parties and at those gatherings, he began to notice the presence of the composer Arnold Schoenberg. And Mann, Thomas Mann, he knew a lot about 19th century music, but modern music, serial music, 12-tone music, really was not his thing. He needed someone to help him. He found Adorno, the musicologist, and he brought him into the house. Adorno began to visit every day to help him with the, with, with the techniques he needed to describe in his book. Now, the problem, of course, was that Schoenberg hated Adorno. Thomas Mann didn't know enough for his music, so he literally took pages of an unpublished book by Adorno, put them directly into his book under his own name. When Schoenberg read them, he realized Thomas Mann couldn't have written this. He doesn't know enough. Moving between all three is Alma Mahler, telling one what the other is saying, showing Schoenberg bits of the book, going back to Thomas Mann to say how angry Schoenberg is. And so, so, so the whole idea of this group of people with the war over, beginning a major feud over the central issue of who Schoenberg's position was, who owns my life. In other words, that anyone reading the book would realize that the composer was based on him or the composer's musical system was based on him. One day in a supermarket in Brentwood, near here in Los Angeles, he met one of the German exiles and said to her, I, I do not have syphilis. And the woman said, I didn't think you did. 
And he said, well, people think, and she realized that because the composer in the novel has syphilis, Schoenberg began to worry, do people think that because the composer is based on me in one element, do people think all the other elements are mine too? So he got himself into an enormous fury, A, because he realized that Adorno was involved in the book, and B, because he felt he himself was depicted as less than a genius, as someone who's, um, I mean, the figure of Adrian Leverkuhn in the man's novel is this sort of lonely genius who's doomed, who's made a pact with the devil, who kills everything he loves. And Schoenberg did, felt that those elements would be always associated with him. And so this feud began um, in this place with the war over, with so many of the exiles having themselves gone home, feeling that, that America was not for them. And certainly by 1950, Thomas Mann's welcome in America had, had, had I think, lessened. He went into East Germany went on one visit to Europe when the Americans specifically asked him not to. His daughter Erica seemed to the Americans to have been too early an anti-fascist. So the FBI began to come to the house to question them both about their allegiances and other people such, such as be, the beginning of the McCarthy movement began to question Thomas Mann about um, his, was he, for example, a communist? And of course, Roosevelt was dead by this time. So his great protector in America was no longer there. So this great genius who had, who had really offered a strange hope in America during the war years to say, this is not about defeating a country. It's not about closing down or, you know, a, a country. It's about opening up a space in our imagination to think that Germany will become a great democracy. By 1952, he decided it was time to go. But America was no longer hospitable. And he um, went not to, live in, not to live in Germany. He never lived in Germany again. He had three more years to live. He was 77 years old. He sold the house in Pacific Palisades that he, that he had built with, with his wife and, and his daughter, Erica. He went to live in Switzerland, where he died three years later. OK, sorry, I'm going to come on without my video because something's playing up on my Internet. So I was just doing a rather slow introduction to you by saying how wonderful the salt path was and that the salt path was a book about the walk that you and your husband Moth took when your house got repossessed and you ended up in a sense homeless and coupled with the fact that Moth himself was very ill at that point. So you undertook a walk that was 630 miles long. I've walked bits of it, unbelievably hilly. You carried everything you had on your back. You got to the end, Moth was better and you wrote a best-selling book. So we cut forward a number of years and now we have another fantastic book called Landlines. So this is another book. Can you tell us how that began? I can. Thanks, Rosie. That's great. Um, yes, Landlines um, sort of starts in the in the winter of 2021. Um, it's in the final lockdown in the UK um, when we've all been confined to to our locality, just just held in our in our little local areas and not able to walk too far um, and not far enough for moth. As we discovered when we walked the southwest coast path, Moth's illness, a neurodegenerative disease for which he'd been told there was no treatment and no cure. When we'd walked those 630 miles of those headlands, um, we'd found that his health improved in ways he'd been told were impossible. So when his health really started to decline again during the winter of 2021, it just seemed like the obvious thing to do, just to try one more time. But Moth, Moth was starting to accept that, um, that, that the really awful end stages of his illness were getting closer and that maybe, maybe actually he could accept that, that that was going to be what was going to happen. But I couldn't accept that. I couldn't accept that, that we should just allow this illness to overtake us without trying just one more time. So there was one night when I was just putting some logs in the log basket. Behind our log basket is our bookshelf and I knocked some books off the bottom shelf of the bookshelves. And they were the guidebooks to, to paths that we'd walked. Guide, the guidebook that we'd used for the Southwest Coast path, it was a, a fat guidebook that had been distorted by water. The edges of it were, were rippled like 
the beach when the tide goes out and in it there were pieces of paper and bits of string and feathers and sand and and the feeling of the coast path and then alongside that there was another guidebook there was a guidebook to Iceland and the long walk that we'd taken there and I opened that and it smelt like sulfur and ash and volcanoes and then there was this other tiny little thin guidebook, one that we'd never used, but it was the guidebook to the Cape Wrath Trail. And in that moment, I just knew, I knew that if anything was going to encourage Moth to try one more time, it was going to be that walk, because it was a place he'd always wanted to go, always wanted to spend time, but never had enough time. And so I left it around the house. I left it in the kitchen and in the bathroom and everywhere you could see it. And eventually, eventually he picked it up and said, yep, yeah, OK, we're going north. And that was just the start, the start of, of what became so much more than just a walk. It became an adventure. It became an experience of a changing country, of a changing landscape and of us changing within it. And we headed north. We headed north to just to walk the Cape Wrath Trail. The Cape Wrath Trail is 230 miles through the most remote, the most isolated part of Britain. It crosses through areas such as the Great Wilderness, areas that have been used and abused by man for centuries, but are not reachable by road. So you can only get into them on foot or, or by boat. Areas that have been deforested over the years and have now become, become just the, uh, the, the land of the deer and the, and the golden eagle. And Noidart, a beautiful, beautiful stretch of land, equally, equally remote, equally isolated. But why, why, why take somebody who is so ill to this, to this place, to this wild, remote area? And... And I was I was consumed with guilt at that point, guilt for having taken him there. For because when someone you care for is ill, the thing that you really want to do is just to wrap them in cotton wool and keep them safe. But this walking in this wild environment had been the only thing that had ever helped Moth's health, and so it just seemed to be the only thing that we could do. And we started walking from a point south of Cape Wrath, because it was closed off by the military, from this beautiful little beach called Shagra. Shagra is just a place that glows pink in the sunset, just as the, as the sun catches, catches the rocks, catches these ancient like bed rocks of our northern point of the country, the most ancient rocks in the country. There's Torridonian sandstone and Luigian nice and and just that feel, that feel that you are standing on the very, very oldest point of the country, the point where everything emanates from. And in that moment, just as we were looking out over the cliffs, about to start or walking on this incredible, impossible journey, this dark form lifted off from the cliffs beneath us and flew out over the sea, just as the light was starting to dip. And we just caught sight of this huge, huge, fast, dark bird with its white tail. It was a white-tailed sea eagle just taking off from the cliffs. So a bird that had been extinct in this country, but had been brought back from Norway, from, from colonies in Norway and, and re-established in this country. And now is actually finding that it can actually live here again and it almost became a symbol of hope for our journey hope that things can come back from the brink not just moth's health but this planet this this earth this country in which we live because prior to this walk i thought actually climate change hadn't reached us it hadn't reached our shores but this change this walk it changed how i felt about that it changed how i viewed everything with regards to this landscape. We walk through this incredible remote land, through a land that's really, it belongs to the deer, this, the deer that roam on the hillsides and are such a, 
a symbol of freedom and space and and that expression of what we believe we still have the land of the golden eagle that, that just inhabit those same glens that, that share that space and it was during that time during that time through that boggy wet incredible landscape that we were walking out of a village on the on the west coast of uh, of uh, the north of Scotland and suddenly we were being passed by by lots of young people people in their early teens their early 20s passing us passing us by on a Wednesday evening just heading out into the wilderness seven miles away from the coast away from the village away from habitation eventually we had to say where are you going where are you all going on a Wednesday night and they said oh we're just climbing Solvan Solvan is this incredible mountain in ascent that just like seems to like form up out of the land into into like a fin of rock a dark fin of rock and it's notoriously difficult to uh, difficult to climb but these young people were all heading up this mountain on a Wednesday night we would say what are you doing why are you why are you doing this and they said well there's nothing to do in the village on a Wednesday night so we thought we'd just go up the mountain a strange, a strange and unexpected answer, I, I have to say. But I've come to realise since that, that that is an absolute result of Scotland having the Land Reform Act, having a right to access the land for their for their cultural and the cultural knowledge of the landscape and its heritage, their natural heritage. Do we have that elsewhere in the country? I don't think so. But also, do we see our young people accessing the mountainsides, walking into the environment simply because there's nothing else to do in the village on a Wednesday night? I don't think so. But I held that idea as we were walking along. I held it sort of in the back of my mind as we walked into this, this incredible landscape a place that is just full of water and bog. And we headed down into a, into a valley bottom late in an afternoon as the rivers were rising and water was pouring from the skies in just torrents of rain. We forded a river and headed into a glen that was just becoming wetter and wetter and wetter by the moment. And as we did so, partway through this glen that we had to get to the other side of and, and ford another river before we could get out, Moth fell, cutting his head. Days confused, we had to put the tent up and we sat in the tent on the only piece of dry ground on waterlogged ground that we could find. And we sat in the tent for two days as the rain just pounded down, turning the hillsides into waterfalls, turning a river into a huge cascade. But then it finally stopped and I opened the tent flaps and there in that incredible, incredible valley of water, the sun cut beneath the, the cloud line and turned the whole valley into a prism of light. And on the other side of this patch of dry ground was a deer. It was a stag. And he shook himself like a, like a dog when it comes out of the bath. He shook himself and the, the water droplets around him turned into a, a rainbow of light in this valley of light. And in that moment, there was a huge, huge sense of being part of the landscape not being observers of it, not watching a scene, but being as much part of that landscape as the, as the deer, as the mountainside, as the water itself. And I held that thought too. And I took that with that thought of those, of those young people climbing that mountain as we passed on and on through, through Scotland, through some of the most beautiful parts of this country, some of the most wild, desolate parts of this country. And held on to that idea of connection and how you have to feel as if you are part of the landscape before you can feel connected to it. And then we headed south in a, in a walk that, that turned into something epic, into an epic exploration of the land and not just a walk across it.
We walked south along the West Highland Way through, through the borderlands of Scotland to, to the borders of, of the country, to the border between England and Scotland and down onto the Pennine Way. The Pennine Way, 260 miles of moorland, of blanket bog that cover this, this spine of England in this incredible thing that we have in such enormous vast quantities in this country, blanket bog, which is an incredible, incredible asset in this time of climate change because it holds millions and millions of tonnes of carbon locked there in these boglands that cover the moorlands of the Pennines. Blanket bogs that were so dry so bone dry, not wet, not oozing in water, not running in streams or holding rivers of water, but bone dry and blowing in the wind. And they became almost like a metaphor for what we were seeing through the rest of the country, where we were seeing, we were seeing a country that should be wet, drying out in a, in a landscape that had no trees and no water. And we were seeing livestock dying. There were dead sheep on some days, dead sheep every hundred meters, dead rabbits. And the Pennines became that view of the Pennines, of, of a land that should have been wet and oozing and holding, holding all that moisture as being a place that was actually becoming the opposite. A place where thousands of feet over, over decades had, had worn that, that that blanket bog of peat had worn it away. And that peat and blanket bog was now not becoming a carbon locker, but becoming a carbon emitter. And it made us realize that actually this landscape in which we live is changing so quickly. Um, and unless we actually view it, unless we actually see it, we can't see how it's changing. And even to the point where the dreaded midges of the north of Scotland are actually now moving south and they're moving right down south to the south of the Pennines. And that in itself should be something we should all fear. But how can we fear it if we don't see it, if we can't actually see it? And that brings me back to, the, to those people that we saw, those young people in Scotland. And they have access to the countryside and they can see it and they can feel it and they can tell what's happening in it. If the rest of us in the rest of the country don't have that access, we can't tell how the country is changing. We can't tell if the midges are moving. And if the midges are moving, how long then before it starts to affect our lives? And we actually become the cuckoos ourselves. Raina, thank you so much. Well, I can tell everybody one way of finding it out, and that's to read your fantastic new book, which really is, um, it was really, really gripping. I found I, I started on it and then I couldn't put it down. And I'd like to be able to say to everybody that there is a kind of happy ending because the actual act of walking once again had an extraordinary effect on Moth, uh, an effect that dazzled his doctors and is worth reading to the last page to find out about this. And I hope we will hear more from you about why walking can, can have this extraordinary transformative effect. I apologize about my internet. I hope that you can hear me okay. I'd like to say thank you very, very much to all our speakers tonight. To to Colm and to Guy, and especially to um, are you are you in Cornwall? Uh, I, am, I fear yeah. that I'm I'm not. Yes, okay, um, and also of course, um, of course also to to Gail who joined us from Amsterdam and all her work she's doing on the Arctic. So thank you all very much. I apologise again about breaking up internet, but you've all been absolutely fantastic speakers and thank you very much to everybody for joining us and we'll see you again soon. Good night.